children, you're dismissed to Children's Church. Second Psalm today. Wonderful, wonderful psalm. Uh, let's take a look at it. Um, first of all, the title of the psalm is a, a song, a song for the Sabbath. Now, what we're doing here is, is we notice that this was particularly prayer, prepared for our Sunday morning worship service. And uh, it is a, a time, it's to be sung, it's to be reflected upon during our time here. And so uh, I thought in that sense it's, it's particularly appropriate that we do this. Now, let me call your attention to something. It says that it is a, a song for the Sabbath. Uh, Sabbath means rest. And when we begin talking about that, uh, one of the problems that has happened in America is that we have gotten away from a day of rest. Um, well, Ellie's dressed, ready to go to work, you know. Uh, for that matter, I'm dressed to go to work. Uh, please laugh. Uh, but uh, but the, point, the point of it is that we don't have a day where we are quiet or where we do something. Now, uh, let's talk about something. If you're like me and you spend a good bit of your time in front of a computer, sitting on your uh, duff, doing things like that, it's really restful to get up and do something, you know? Um, I try and keep a few little projects around the house, not because I, I like the, that stuff particularly, though I do, but it helps rest and uh, helps do that. On the other hand, if you're active all week and whatever, um, uh, it's time for rest. I don't know about you, but, but for me, between 2 and 3 on Sundays, nap time. Right? I don't know what happens that the lids just go shut right about that time. <laughs> uh, that's what you do. But, but the point is, it's to be sung during a time of rest and reflection. Am I making sense? So, uh, let's take a look at it a little bit here. Um, he starts the psalm off with what I think is one of the great understatements. Uh, it's good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing uh, praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning, your faithfulness by night, uh, with the ten-string lute, with the harp, with the resounding music upon the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by what you have done. I will sing for joy at the works of your angels. Um, it's a good thing to give thanks and praises to the Lord. Uh, this is the theme of the psalm. Oftentimes, when you read the psalms, you will find that, um, that the uh, first verse or so announces what the theme is. And the theme says that it's good to praise the Lord and to uh, make, your make your name known to the Most High. 
Uh, he says here uh, to declare, uh, to proclaim your loving kindness in the morning. Loving kindness goes back to a sermon that I preached, it's been several months now ago, about chesed. Chesed. It's translated, it's hard to translate because it's so broad. Uh, most places doing loving kindness, your NIV translates it love. But this loving kindness, this idea behind it, there's several things. How is God loving kindness to us? Well, uh, in redeeming us from our enemies and our troubles. This poor man cried, the Lord saved him, and the Lord saved him, saved him out of all his troubles. Have you had any troubles this week? I've had a couple. You did. But it's Sunday morning. We're sitting here worshiping together. And all of a sudden, when we come to the Lord and come and face to face with Him, all of a sudden those troubles begin to diminish and we find the Lord saving us out of them. What is it? It's present. It's loving kindness. He saves us out of our trouble and redemption from our enemies. You got somebody trying to destroy you? I can tell you that uh, enemies happen in life. Sometimes they're in our families. Sometimes they're at work. Sometimes they're different places. Uh, but uh, they happen, but the Lord saves us from them. Um, in preservation of our life from death. I think all of us can remember or call to, uh, call to mind situations where we could have been killed. Yeah, we think about those things. And God, in His kindness, preserved our lives. And then, uh, He loves us in quickening our spiritual life. Now that word quicken means to make alive. Scripture teaches us that at one time, we were dead in trespasses and sins. But just as Christ came and was put into the tomb and rose to life again, He brings life to us spiritually. So that instead of being dead spiritually, meaning we're absolutely insensitive to spiritual things and the things of God, what He does, He makes us alive. And all of a sudden, spiritual things not only uh, enliven us, but it nourishes us. And we find ourselves happier. We find ourselves stronger. We find ourselves having more stamina. Why? Because God loves us and brings life to us. Uh, from redemption from sin. Scripture teaches us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we've all, uh, we all know that the soul that sins, it shall die. But God showed His love toward us in that He sent Christ to die for our sins and to bring us back and to redeem us from our sinful behavior. Can somebody say amen? amen? Amen. Isn't that wonderful that we can have those kinds of things uh, happening to us? Why? Because of God's loving kindness. Uh, and finally, in keeping covenants. Uh, the, the term has it is often and most often used in the idea of God keeping His covenants. He made some promises to us that He has never let us go. Well, part of the story of Israel has to do with demonstrating God's faithfulness in the face of unfaithfulness. Think about the story of Israel. God gives them the Ten Commandments. Moses isn't gone a month and a half and they come back, they've forgotten the commandments, they've got a golden calf, they're unfaithful. The story of, of uh, the through the judges is a just a cycle of, of, uh, of uh, apostasy and problems and revival. It's just a constantly going like that. We get into the kings. We have good kings. We have bad kings. But more often than not, we're breaking the covenant and we're we're mixing. We then God punishes them, send them back. Uh, to uh, Babylonian captivity, but he brings them back to their homeland and, and they live forever. Their enemies come. Uh, things happen time and time again. 
But what happens is, through it all, through all of their unfaithfulness, God keeps His covenant. Amen. Now, do you think He kept a record of that just to tell us a Bible story? Folks, there are times when we may break our covenant with God. And we may believe that it has destroyed our relationship with Him. But let's understand something. God keeps His covenant, and part of that covenant is, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? Because He's a covenant-keeping God, he remembers our frame that we're dust. And He is a God who will restore and keep covenant to us. Amen. What wonderful things to think about on a Sunday morning. Amen. 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 Okay. And then it says to declare your faithfulness at night. Now, faithfulness, well, it's maybe a Siamese twin to uh, loving kindness, isn't quite the same thing. When we start talking about faithfulness, we're talking about firmness. I don't know about you, but it seems like things are changing so fast that nothing seems firm. But God said, I am God, and I change not. Amen. He's firm. He's predictable. He's settled. You can, you can count on where He was, there He is, there he will be. He's firm. He's settled. He's steadfast. <clears throat> We've had a lot of wind this spring. And it took out a lot of things around here. It really did. Remember that? Well, when the storms and the winds of life begin to blow, you will find God, when the storm's over, He's still standing. Everything else may be blown away. But He is still standing. He is still firm. You can mark with it. And finally, fidelity. He's true. We're living in a world where faithfulness and fidelity is, a, is almost a lost concept. Being faithful Holding to things. Faithful friends. Faithful spouses. Faithful to John. My heart was broken. It's been broken ever since the news came out. And uh, Father David, the priest at St. Joseph, caught half a million dollars of investment. It's as if our brothers in the Catholic Church don't have enough problems. It broke my heart. And I, I was thinking last night, what about those people in that parish that were absolutely betrayed? It's sad. But it's not God. I'm going to tell you something. God will never betray you. God will be faithful to you. God will keep His promises to you. God will uh, uh, do what He said He will do. He's faithful. Amen. And said, <clears throat> good to sing about that tonight. Good to sing about that tonight. Notice, He says to declare it with music. Do you ever wonder why music is such a, a part of our worship service? I, I really do have a, a, a bit of a problem, but I can't think of a better word. We talk about worship as being the song service and preaching as being the other service. But the truth is, all of it is worship. Amen. The music is meant to sing praises and 
uh, to sing things uh, to God and for God and whatever. But he says to do it with music. I want to ask you something. Have you ever been down and driving down the road and begin singing your own song? Father, I thank you for the way you've been with me. Thank you for such a wonderful vacation and having time to be with family. Thank you for my kids and the way things are going. Ah, <coughs> oh, Father, there were so many little God things that happened in vacation. Just want to praise you. Now, it ain't pretty, <laughs> but it's good. Might not do anything for you, but it does a lot for me. And he says we need to sing with that. But here, now this is for uh, you instrumentals. It's declared with music. You're supposed to do it with a lute. Now, uh, uh, a lute is a, is an interesting impact. That's the weirdest shaped thing. I don't know how you play something that the handle's cockeyed and down like. But he said, play it with the lute. <clears throat> or the harp. Now notice that harps we've got, big ones we've got, little ones, but, but praise him with the harp. And uh, thirdly, praise him with the lyre. Now if you'll notice, it's a harp-like instrument. But what it is, it's got, notice the horns on the thing, that it's got this U-type shape, and there's a sound box on the bottom. And it's meant to be plucked, usually, but... Uh, it can be bowed uh, or strummed, um, but it's a part of the heart family, but it's a, uh, yeah, that's what a liar is. He said, do that. Now, one of the things, and I'm, I'm saying this a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but did you notice that all three of them were stringed instruments? Huh? Mm -hmm. Craig, you're right on, buddy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gene, your guitar is right there, you know. Get that mandolin going, you know. <laughs> But, but it's stringed instruments. And, and to do now, they didn't have pianos, and they didn't have uh, oh, uh, a lot of the instruments that we have today, but the bottom line of it is, is, to, uh, is to make music and to, to use the instruments. One of the things, just a, an aside, a rabbit trail, there's a bit of a controversy in some congregations about the instruments that we use. Now, let me tell you something. If we ever find somebody around here that can play the drums, we're going to have them here. And if I can ever get Craig to play a bass guitar, we may have that or find some things. But, but God, God isn't just the God of piano and organ. But I, I will tell you, as much as I love Charlie's playing, well, there's something missing this morning, wasn't there? Now Lucy being yes. here playing that organ. Yeah. We, we need to. And so we're, uh, we're, we're thankful for it. But it says it's good to do that. Finally, he says, in the morning, talk about his loving kindness, in the evening, Talk about his faithfulness. Begin and end each day recounting God's loving kindness and his faithfulness. <clears throat> As I got that, it, it just occurs to me, you know, I bet we'd sleep better if instead of watching the news and going to bed, we talk about God's faithfulness and his loving kindness, I'll bet we'd sleep a lot better. <laughs> oh, my. This next verse, this next section is very interesting to me. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. Again, the psalmist is a master of understatement. You think God's thoughts are deep? You know? <laughs> Uh, how great are your works, O Lord? Your thoughts are very deep, but catch this. This is why it says that. A senseless man has no knowledge, nor does a stupid man understand this. What are they so stupid that they don't understand? That when the wicked sprout up like grass, 
And all who did iniquity flourished. It was only that they might be destroyed forevermore. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies will perish. All who do iniquity will be scattered. I don't know about you, but I have really struggled with the wickedness, this wave of wickedness that has, it's just, I, in fact, I don't even know I want to call it a wave, probably more of a tsunami of, of wickedness that has come on our nation. Abortion and um, this militant LGBT stuff and um, uh, the taking the prayer out of schools and uh, just the the lewdness that our, our society and for granted I can't advertise a pair of sunglasses without a woman that's nearly naked you know I mean it's just it's, it's just come to a point uh, that there, there's just this wave of wickedness and it seems like uh, you know we our politicians seem to be on the take and they can't tell the truth and and you know all of this is going on and it's destroying our nation I when I think of all this I'm reminded of the scripture that says if the foundations be destroyed what can the righteous do and the answer is nothing and I can tell you this evil thing that's going out is intended to destroy the the, the foundations of America a uh, news article this week said that the distinction between the Republicans and the Democrats, the conservatives and the liberal, is over <clears throat> religion. Forty-four percent of liberal Democrats say that the church hurts America. That's scary. That's scary. Now, I'm standing here saying to God, and been praying, Lord, why are you letting these people destroy your creation? God created America. We can talk about our history and whatever, but God created it. Why are you allowing that? Huh? What's going on? And uh, the answer is, part of the answer is that God is allowing evil to flourish so that it will be thoroughly destroyed. Now that's a tough faith to hold at this time, isn't it? But think back about it. In our studies on Wednesday night on, uh, in, in Isaiah, we, uh, uh, we have been studying about the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, they were vicious, vicious. They, they had the idea that theirs was the only culture. And God allowed them to go until their, their evil became so obvious that they were destroyed. And they are now nothing but a chapter in the history of destroyed. I want you to think about the rise of the Nazis in Germany and fascism. Oh, it, it looked good and it rose, it rose fast and they began to conquer Western Europe, Eastern Europe. They were doing things that were great and one, but once the evil became apparent to even their people what happened? It's destroyed. And Nazi Germany is no longer. And everybody equates Auschwitz with fascism and Nazi Germany. Why? It got so far and God destroyed it. Now I don't know where this will end. And you have heard me say that revival is coming to our area. I don't know when, I don't know how, it may not be in my lifetime, I hope that it is. 
But when I'm talking about a revival, I'm talking about a revival of religion that changes the moral character of, uh, of, the, of the area. That's what I'm, I'm not talking about us having a few uh, services and have uh, 10 people get saved and things go on in Oakley and uh, oh, uh, Chesney and Brant and whatever, just the way they always have. That's not what I'm talking I'm talking about a major change. Major change. It's coming. I'm going to tell you something. The wickedness that we see will be destroyed. Okay? Why? Because God overcomes his enemies. He's not worried. We are. Let's see, he's faithful. He loves us. He conquers enemies. He's going to do it. All right, making sense? This next one then is quite personal. <clears throat> he talked about going to destroy the industry and uh, enemies and whatever. The psalmist ends it on this note. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild oaks. I have been anointed with fresh oil. My eye. I has looked exaltedly upon my foes. My ears hear the evildoers who rise up against me. The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like the cedar in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Now, to those of us in here who are past 60, and there are many of us, this has particular uh, uh, particular things for us. First of all, the horn. When you read horn in, uh, in the Bible, uh, Revelation, whatever, the horn is a symbol of strength and authority. Okay? And he said, uh, you've destroyed all those people, but you've exalted my horn like a wild ox. Now you have to understand that. Get that picture. A wild ox is strong, untamed, nothing stands in its way. You've exalted my horn like those horns. Okay? And then he goes on to say, I have been anointed with fresh oil. First of all, you have to understand that in those days, they used olive oil the way we would use body lotions. And so when we start talking about being anointed, uh, it's a whole lot more than what we do here when we anoint people and pray for them, put a little cross on their head. No, what they do, they take and they smear it all over their body, and it, it just covers them. In fact, uh, there are some places that if you get anointed with oil, they're going to dump it on your head and it's going everywhere, you know. Uh, but, but that's what they did. It covers. And, and when we begin talking about uh, oh, uh, uh, being anointed and being used, it talks about how when we get dry, our skin gets dry. It's a hot, dry climate. We can be refreshed. We will be refreshed. Now, to pick it up though, anointing in the scripture is to be called, gifted, and empowered for a task. For example, David was anointed for to be king of Israel. In fact, he was anointed three times to be king of Israel. First by Samuel, uh, the second by the tribe of Judah and whatever. And thirdly, when all of Israel came together under him, he was anointed, which meant that he was called to do that, but he was also empowered. He was given the gifts. He was given the strength. Uh, he, he was given uh, the authority. He was given the gifts. David had wonderful administrative gifts. Don't have time to... Uh, explain about that, but had wonderful administrative gifts, and, and he was a warrior, and he could protect people. He had all those gifts, but he was also on the throne. People were subject to him, and he was empowered to do the job. Okay? Okay. <laughs> 
confess to you that when I went on vacation, I was dry. I mentioned to the board that I was struggling for sermons and do, and I didn't feel like I was getting anything done. I needed something. Now, we can go on with the anointing and the power that we have for so long. But if you look carefully through the book of Acts, I'm an I'm a old line holiness person. I believe that there's a, there's a second work that comes. But I also believe that there's a third and a fourth and a fifth. Because if you trace it through the book of Acts, you get the Holy Spirit coming in Acts 2, and you don't get to Acts 4, and they're praying, and they get anointed again, and you go on to about Acts 6 or 8, and it happens again. See, the truth of the matter is, when, what happens is, is we need the Holy Spirit, and we need times of refreshing, and we need times of fresh oil. What was so precious to me on this vacation, last day of vacation, we're getting ready to come home. And the Lord, uh, you, know, you know, you know how they say the Lord led us. It sounds like coincidence, but you know how coincidences are with the Lord. We went to Fraser Road Church of God, and my friend Rick Webb is there. Um, Rick is a uh, is a rather special person. He's powerful in prayer and, and uh, a preacher that will inspire you. And uh, we got there and they have a time of prayer before the service and I went in and I said to him, I asked Rick, I said, Rick, will you pray for Lucy and I? We knelt at the altar and Rick began to pray. And he said, Father, please anoint Pastor John with fresh oil. And I knew then what I'd been struggling with and what was going on. And I felt, I felt God's Spirit come. Later on in their prayer time, Rick says, you know, we've got them here, but I feel led of the Spirit to have the whole congregation lay hands on them. Awesome. And they called us to the front of the congregation. They laid hands on Lucy and I. And they prayed for us to be effective. And that whatever our work has been, that it would that, that this that there would be a new level of effectiveness. I needed that. And I, I'll be very transparent with you. I'm not through. I, uh, there, there's still an emptiness. And God has come in a little. It reminded me of the song. Is, um, there shall be showers of blessings. It says mercy drops falling around us. But for the showers we bleed. I'm looking for that fresh oil. That fresh time. Something that takes me beyond what I've been in the past. Whatever it has been, we're thankful for it, been good, and whatever. But, but there's more. I was praying. No one to refresh one. What an idiot. That's why I made the comments at the start of the service about camp meetings, conferences, places where you can go. You've got to go somewhere where you can get under the spout, get away. I can tell you the thing that was best about vacation. When I closed my Bible here on Sunday, that Sunday morning in June, I never opened it again. I never picked it up until the Sunday I went to church with, uh, with uh, Rick. Why? It was empty. And I needed to rest. And I needed somebody to be me. Isn't this a wonderful promise? Amen. You're going to anoint me with fresh oil. Now, the thing that 
that, that goes with that is that the righteous will flourish. <laughs> now, this, this is the thing. I'm an old guy, okay? <laughs> I don't feel like it, whatever. But I am 68. My wife is 70. That is, uh, you know, that is old people stuff. All right? So I, I, can, I can do that. But too often what we do is, is we think to think that when we get old, we are no longer useful. But he says, I'm going to anoint you with fresh oil. And you're going to have fruit in your old age. I want to finish well. I want my latter years to be more effective than my younger years. I want to be uh, something that God, as we come through the line, I want to finish strong. I want to be able to say with, with Paul, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished the course. And henceforth there's laid up for me a crown in heaven. Amen. And what this psalm says is, well, you're an old guy, but that's okay. <laughs> because I'm going to give you something more to go on. I'm going to anoint you. Help you to be more effective in your latter years. So says there's fruit in their old age. <laughs> They're full of sap and very green. Does that mean we're all just a bunch of saps? I, I don't know. But the idea behind that, have you ever been around old people who are just dried up? You know? They sit in a rocker and they do this, they do that, and blah, blah, blah. You know? Just old and now these trees that are planted in the Lord's garden, they may be old, <laughs> but they're still green. You know, one of the worst things we can do is retire and sit down. I've watched it. No, the idea behind retirement is you don't retire from something. You retire to a new vision. Oh, you mean anointed with fresh oil? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Anointed with fresh oil. It's a time where we're able to do what we couldn't do when we were forced to do 40 hours a week, and it was necessary. But the Lord has blessed us so that we don't have to work. Uh, we, we can draw on some things. And uh, we get anointed for fresh oil. We're still green. We're still bearing fruit. Instead of drying out and quit producing. I want to go back to the scripture there. It says, why are you still green? And the answer is to declare that the Lord is upright, to declare that he is my rock, and to declare that there's no unrighteousness in him. Amen. 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 Let's close. Three questions for reflection. First of all, it's the Sabbath. Are you taking a portion of today to thank and praise the Lord for His works in your life? It's easy to come to church, go home, put the dinner on, and, and go for it, whatever. But to intentionally take Sabbath, a day of rest, to thank God and praise Him for the works in your life. Second question. Does this wave of evil discourage you? God is still on the throne. It is flourishing now so that it will become completely destroyed later. Can you add that to your faith, your hope, what you're expecting God to do? It's Friday, Sunday's coming. 
We're resurrection people. That's where we live. Finally, are you dry spiritually? Do you fear that as you grow older, you will cease to become productive and become a liability? Well, my suggestion to you is trust the Lord and seek another anointing. Fresh oil. Heavenly Father, we've shared a wonderful song for the Sabbath. Will you be with us? Father, you know our needs, you know our frames, you know we're dust, you know what we struggle with, you know where, where our faith is and isn't and whatever. I simply ask that you would be with us as a church. And Father, as a church, will you please anoint us, our whole church, with fresh oil? We ask it. In the name of the one who promised to send us his spirit, Jesus, amen. Let us stand. Take your hymn, hymn number 519. If you need to pray, the altars are open. Ask God for fresh oil, whatever. The uh, front pews will be open if you need it. If you need to come. I thought it'd be just a good way to end the service by singing to God, Great is Thy Faithfulness.